Good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, New Year, New HR Compliance Considerations, presented by Rain Associates, a top 100 regional CPA and business consulting firm with offices across Ohio. My name is Imani Fields, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items to cover. First, if you have any questions during today's presentation, you may enter them into the chat box on your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as we can at the conclusion of today's presentation. However, to be respectful of your time, we know that we will not be able to get to them all. Therefore, following today's webinar, we will review all questions and send out the answers via email as soon as we can. When you receive this email, you'll also receive the recording of today's presentation, as well as a link to participate in a very short evaluation. Please take a few moments to share your thoughts about the presentation as a whole, the information provided, and our presenter. Your feedback is important as we determine future webinar topics. Also, if you'd like a copy of today's slides, you'll find that they're available in the handout section of the webinar dashboard on your computer screen. Today's webinar will be given by Renee West. Renee West is a senior manager and leader of Rain Associates HR consulting practice. With more than 27 years of experience in human resources, Renee specializes in assisting organizations with their manufacturing, nonprofit, contingent staffing, food, and additional industries with their HR challenges. And now I will pass it on to you, Renee. Thank you, Imani. Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Thank you for joining us this morning. We appreciate your time. And so as we move through today, we are going to be sharing some resources regarding HR compliance as we enter the new year and some topics that are very important from a discussion perspective as it relates to the FFCRA leave and updated stimulus package. So let's get started and we'll talk through our agenda and go from there. Specifically, we will talk about the CARES Act and the updates to the FFCRA leave. We'll talk a little bit in reference to the payroll tax credit that is also a part of that and share some, some facts from the Department of Labor as well. We'll also talk through some of the unemployment updates as a result of the relief bill as well. Next slide, please. And a, a big topic of conversation right now centers around the COVID-19 and vaccine resources. So we, we want to share with you uh, resources as, you know, phase rollout, uh, share resources for you and your employees, and also share some best practices for you and uh, as we move forward and navigate this, this ever-changing um, topic. It's actually very exciting to know that there is a vaccine, so that's a positive thing as well. So we do want to focus on the positive also. Also talk through some HR compliance policies and, you know, specifically what to keep on our radar, what policies to have in your handbook specifically relating to these updates and everything to keep you compliant. Next slide, please. And also looking at, you know, best ways to help your organization mitigate risk talking about some job descriptions as well. So we have a lot to cover today. Uh, please know that uh, there are resources that we will mention at the end of our, of our broadcast uh, that will be downloadable for you, um, for you and your employees. So I don't feel that you need to take all the notes now, but the resources will be here in copies of the presentation as well. So let's go ahead and get started. The very first piece that we want to talk about is the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, or as they call it, FFCRA. This, and we'll actually talk through a little further about the specifics, the, the change to this legislation as of December 31st of 2020, um, it was changed from a mandated requirement for employees to offer, employers to offer. It is now a voluntary basis that employers can continue to offer this FFCRA leave. And as we as we look at where we are as a nation, continued nationwide COVID cases are increasing. So as employers are starting to think about next steps, um, it's important also to be aware of where everything falls as we are, you know, moving through this, this pandemic moving forward. Next slide, please. So as we talk about the, the FFCRA, this is a, a resource that we have developed and many of you have seen this probably before, but just as a recap for those of you, the FFCRA 
does provide for paid leave for up to 80 hours at 100% pay for any employee that would meet the criteria that you see as listed on the left side of this form. What is important to, to keep in mind, again, this is now voluntary for employers to offer. This form also suffices as, you know, the ability to document this information for this leave as well. Now, if we looked on the next piece of the next slide, it will actually show you the final piece of, of this form as well. Keep in mind also as, as we move forward, schools, you know, will continue to start to get back in session and this leave still includes the ability for individuals and employees to request leave if they would need to take care of a child who's home from school, if their daycare is closed, or if for some reason the school were to close as well. So it's important that, you know, employers are asking and we've heard employers say, should we continue to offer this FFCRA? And that really is up to, the, up to each employer. Um, specifically, it's important that to understand to be compliant that if you decide as an organization to continue to offer this to your employees that you're consistent in how it is being administered uh, so for example be sure that if you have one individual that you know meets the criteria for the leave and is requesting the leave and you grant the leave that if employee b comes forward six months two months later and has the same criteria and is eligible and you don't and you don't pay the leave there could be issues with that so consistency and communication is very important um, as we continue to move forward with this also what's important to keep in mind um, as well we've talked with many companies that um, are now starting to see employees or individuals that are starting to uh, have COVID issues and need to take time off where maybe last year their workplace they didn't really start to see any of that so they didn't need to administer any of the leaves so now we're seeing a lot of companies you know are starting to see that increase in their employees just because of the number of cases nationwide that are increasing so again as employers are looking at do we want to continue to offer this keep that in mind that we're now starting to see companies that are starting to experience the need for this leave where versus six months ago, they might not have had that need. One of the important pieces for employers to keep in mind is the relief bill also will continue to allow employers to receive payroll tax credit for providing emergency sick leave or emergency family medical leave through March 31st, 2021. And specifically that is to recover cost of providing the required FFCRA leave and voluntarily provide that paid leave for their employees. Um, and we also have subject matter experts within our firm that are happy to talk with you further if you need further information on this. Um, but there are um, opportunities for you as the employer to help the employee and then also opportunities for help for the employer as well. Next slide. As we talked about, you know, as you as an employer are looking at, you know, do we continue to offer this FFCRA leave? Consider the, the COVID cases as we talked about. Um, also consider, you know, taking care of your employees. And um, as you know, employees, employers everyone's going through a lot of challenging times right now and you know the best thing that that you can do is ensure that you're offering um, some type of assistance for them as well and as we're talking about the ffcra it's also important to talk about the documentation that's required for these type of leaves next slide please and as we talked before, the form that we referenced earlier is just a, a sample form that we've put together um, to ensure that employers are documenting um, the, the leave when it is requested. What's important to keep in mind is employers are required to document and keep the leave request, even if they've been denied um, or approved for four years from the date of the leave request. And that can just be a simple form such as what we've utilized um, where you can have the employee sign, you indicate how much time they have. 
This, of course, would be in conjunction with the payroll records that you would have with specific wages coded to COVID-19 pay, for example, that would also suffice as documentation purposes. But it's important to keep that information you know, on file. Um, so when it comes time, if there ever are questions that you do have a resource to show that you had a procedure, it was followed, and you have documentation to support that. Okay, so let's talk just real quickly here. This is a question that we've received um, from a couple um, different individuals that we've talked to. And according to the Department of Labor on their updated fact sheet, this is fact number five. Um, if an employer failed to pay an employee for FFCRA leave taken or requested from April 1st, 2020 through December 31st, um, the employee may file a complaint with the DOL which is the Department of Labor. Um, we're starting to see an increase in claims that are being uh, put through where employees uh, state that they should have received pay and did not. Um, so it's important that, you know, if employers do, you know, if there is FFCRA leave that was that should have been paid, um, that it is, is filed and taken care of. And we can, again, talk through the best practices as well with that. Individuals and employees or the complainants can file within two, up to two years after this, this incident. So it's also important to, to keep that in mind. As we talked about, another common question is the FFCRA and who, and who does it actually apply to, what businesses, and just as a reminder, it covers businesses with fewer than 500 employees and certain public employers. And yes, there are exceptions to the FFCRA leave. Um, and again, too extensive for us to get into now, but that is a resource link that we've provided at the end of this um, webinar as well from the Department of Labor. Okay, so as part of the, the relief bill, there were also some updates to the unemployment compensation. So it's important that we shed some light on these uh, as we move forward. I'm gonna share a couple stories with um, some scenarios that we've that we've come across as well. With the new stimulus bill, it has extended the pandemic unemployment assistance or the PUA through March 14th of 2021. And um, basically it also, you know, the, the federal pandemic unemployment compensation supplement that was previously $600 per week on top of an individual state unemployment benefits has now been decreased to $300 per week. That's starting December 26th through March 14th. There's additional unemployment information as well, um, but it's important that we just wanted to let you know that this is still um, moving forward. Um, hopefully organizations you know, are starting to call workers back, uh, but in the event that there you know, continue to be needed layoffs, this pandemic unemployment assistance will um, also be a part of the process. Next slide, please. So as, we, as we've gone through the last, since March of last year, um, a lot, we've seen a lot. We have seen, you know, a lot of legislation that was pushed through very quickly to help the American people and businesses. And part of that, as we talked about, ha has been the pandemic unemployment assistance. And a lot of the feedback from employers throughout the United States focused around, for example, we have um, workers that were trying to call back to work and they're refusing to come back to work because they were receiving $600 a week on top of their, their supplemented um, unemployment compensation. So it's, it was hard for people to have individuals come back into the workplace. So there was a lot of negative feedback in reference to there needs to be more accountability and more um, requirements to be able to substantiate whether or not an employee is eligible for the unemployment. As part of that, um, the, the new relief bill states that they are implementing return to work reporting for the CARES Act, and that basically will require an individual that is on unemployment 
to be able to report back that they are actively searching, um, et cetera. And that will be at the statewide level. There will be continued regulations rolling out in reference to that also. Um, so stay tuned. But, you know, they are hearing that this has been, you know, a contention with a lot of employers that, you know, we understand people are laid off, but when work's available, um, also, there's a reporting mechanism that will be in place that you as an employer, if you're calling an individual back into work and they say they do not want to come back, you as the employer can actually go in and complete a reporting form to notify the state that the individual re refuses the employment. Next slide, please. Um, actually, if we could back up one more, I'm sorry, Abby, um, as we as we talk further about the unemployment, I do want to share some some comments and what we're starting to see out in the in the field. Um, a number of employers are you might run across starting to receive um, separation of employee information forms from the unemployment office. Um, as you know, with the pandemic, there were a huge amount of backlog and paperwork and unemployment um, claims. A lot of them were pushed through, some maybe not necessarily should have been pushed through, but they're now catching back up. And a lot of these forms are now starting to go out to the employers where either the employee's already been back to work or um, they're, there are just there they're just backlogs. So if you're starting to see that come in, do not be alarmed. What you we do want to caution you um, is we have had some uh, companies that have said that they've received you know an unemployment claim or a separation of benefits for an employee that has still been working and was never laid off. So in talking with that worker, they determined that you know he he or she did not go on and, un, and apply for unemployment so there's some fraudulent um, issues there please keep in mind that the unemployment office does have a specific unemployment fraud division that employers can reach out to and also have that employee reach out to um, because evidently there could have been a violation of their social security number or something that um, would have caused that fraudulent claim. So keep that in mind too, as something that we're starting to see, um, unfortunately that, that has taken place. So be aware, you know, as an employer, if you're starting to receive those statements back from the unemployment office, that you look at that and be sure that they're accurate as well. Okay, next slide. So, Let's move into a very important topic right now, and that is the COVID-19 vaccine. And as we move forward, um, you know, vaccines are being distributed and uh, at a statewide level, at a national level, um, and there are different rollouts and phases of, of the COVID vaccine. Um, this is good news. So we'd like to talk a little bit about, and we can move to the next slide, um, this is just an example, and we've shared some PDF resources, again, at the back of this presentation for you, for your employees as well. Uh, but right now, we as a state, as with other states, are in a phased in approach of, of the vaccine. So basically, you know, focusing on those based on the governor's address yesterday, um, the state obviously is focusing on critical groups such as healthcare workers, um, long-term uh, nursing care facilities and, you know, those individuals at high risk. So it's important for employers to, to have resources and know because your employees are going to be asking questions and that's what we want to help you with. We want to help provide some resources for you as we move forward. So next slide. So, um, Actually, we'll skip over this slide, and I think if we go to the next one, there we go. Um, so question of the day, and we've received this from a lot of, of different places. And also keep in mind, you know, we are providing guidance based on, on our, our information from our sources. Um, we are not lawyers, so as you move forward and move through and look to possibly implement um, COVID vaccine procedures, please do be sure that you reach out to your legal resource. But a short answer is yes, you as an employer can legally mandate vaccines for employees if you choose. Um, a few exceptions exist, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And again, ensure consistency in administration of that. 
Um, you know, what we're hearing um, from out in the field is, you know, majority of employers are not requiring mandating vaccines. However, they are sharing resources with their employees about the importance of the vaccine and, you know, supporting it that way as well. And of course, that varies by industry. Obviously, hospitals are, are different, um, but that's what we're hearing and, and kind of seeing as a, as a trend at this point. So next slide, let's, let's talk a little bit about if you as an employer decide that you want to implement and regulate a COVID vaccine program. Keep in mind the exceptions that we mentioned would be if you have an employee that would say, um, if it's a violation of anything under Title VII, Title VII is, applies to any employer with 15 or more employees. And it basically, uh, we're starting to hear individuals that will refuse to take the vaccine because of religious beliefs. So that is an exception that would fall under Title VII as an example. Next slide. Um, as we talk about any type of, you know, COVID vaccine or vaccines, the Americans with Disabilities Act is also an exception if you have an employee that says, I do not want the vaccine because of the ADA. The Americans with Disabilities Act as employers, it's for 25 or more employees in a business. And this would be for reasonable accommodations for employees due to medical reasons that fall as criteria underneath the major illnesses on the ADA. And we're just talking about this again, just to keep in mind that if you do have a program, these could be some exceptions for workers that fall under these cases, and we need to be sure that you have compliance with those. Next slide. Um, reasonable accommodation, you possibly have heard, you know, if an individual says, I don't want to do something, I don't want to have the vaccine because of A, um, you know, it's a reasonable accommodation is something that is asked or an adjustment to the work environment to allow the employee to comply with his or her either religious beliefs or qualified medical conditions under the ADA. That's a lot of terms and a lot of jargon. So let's move to the next slide and talk about really what that is. Um, as an employer, should you have an example or should you decide to move forward with this type of, of required vaccine? An employee can come to a supervisor and manager and all they need to say are two things. I need an accommodation because I don't want to have the vaccine and here's the reason why. You as the employer want to ensure, are your managers and supervisors trained on the response to the employee? Um, what should they say? What should they do? Any type of request such as this automatically falls under what would be um, a discovery discussion, um, which should be handled by the human resource department or designated individuals. So again, just very important to keep this in mind um, that your frontline individuals and managers need to know need to know the specifics. Next slide. And this again is just a, a quick review of, you know, a, an undue burden would be if as an employer, you could not make a reasonable accommodation because it would be an undue hardship or burden to your business. And that basically states that it would be um, a financial cost to the company for you to make that accommodation. And again, this is just more of an update as to what that would be. The biggest piece um, as we start to lead and move into more compliance discussions is not only with COVID vaccine, but with any type of reasonable accommodation that someone might ask. Your organization's ADA policies in your handbooks are essential for that interactive process and can also help mitigate risk as well. Next slide. A couple of things to keep in mind as well, too, for, for those organizations. Um, any unionized employer should, of course, you know, address your, your collective bargaining agreements before any um, vaccination policies would be, would be completed. As we mentioned before, discuss with your legal resource um, before implementing any type of policy. 
And we have a link here that we've shared, and this is a great resource for your employees and for you also as business owners. Myths versus fact sheet. Um, this is from the CDC and also talks through a lot of common questions, a lot of resources and credible resources. Um, as I always tell employers, there's a lot of information out there and you can go on websites and find all the information, but it's not always necessarily the truth. Um, so one of the biggest pieces that we've learned, obviously, from this pandemic is the need to provide your employees with up to date and current information. And these resources are free. So that's also very important and a great resource for you as well. As we talk through and look at, you know, the, the last year and look at what has happened and as we move forward into this new year, there's a lot of obviously more heightened awareness on compliance. And as employers, we've had a lot of discussions with companies that have said, you know, I've I've put my handbook on the back burner for the last, you know, couple years. I really, you know, what should I focus on? What should be areas that I need to look at first? Um, you know, and, and part of that, and some of these might not apply to all businesses, such as the re remote work policy, but that's one of them um, to keep in mind that some companies have, you know, moved to more remote work. And, you know, as that opportunity would continue, what do those type of policies look like and how to best navigate that, that new employment landscape. The leave mandates is, is pretty extensive. So the leave mandates would cover what are your sick time policies? What are your time off policies? Um, with the current pandemic and the FFCRA and some of the other um, temporary policies, um, you can definitely make a reference in your handbook to a supplemental policy for these. That way it's it's mentioned and your resources are separate from the handbook, um, but it's important that you do keep that information in there, um, at least a reference, but you don't wanna have to, whenever the FFCRA would, would end, have to redo your handbook again. So that's why we recommend definitely having those policies separate. Um, we do expect there will be updates to the workplace posters as well um, that will, talk specifically about the FFCRA and more workplace safety. So stay tuned and we'll be sharing links for those as those start to come through as we as we move forward. And and actually if you could back up one more one more slide there Abby please. Um, as we talk through workplace safety, that's a, a very again a very broad piece of of what you as organizations provide, looking at your, your policies as it relates to safety in the workplace with COVID specifically, continuing to ensure that you're providing that safe workforce for your employees. We've also provided a link at the end of this webinar for the OSHA resources for continued support in the event that there's questions surrounding uh, your workplace. Um, we have heard there have been, there has been an increase in workplace audits of late, um, focusing not necessarily on possibly COVID as maybe one reason, but once they're 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 in there and looking, there are other things they can they can also see. So also be aware that that's increasing and we expect you know, the audits will increase throughout throughout the rest of this year for a number of different types of things. Um, workplace safety is, is one of the biggest uh, policy areas that you can um, support your organization and mitigate risk. Um, again, use the resources and we're happy to help out for that as well. Another big piece of of policy updates and what to look at as we're you know moving into to this new year um, this is not new but the anti-discrimination policies you know looking at being sure that your practices are consistent and regulated and you have a process in place for how you how you recruit how you hire how you terminate how you reduce staffing how you train how you discipline 
Title VII is a broad policy that 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 provides a lot of protection um, for discrimination. And again, this is an area that we have seen from a nation, national perspective in talking with the Civil Rights Commission as well, that continues to increase in the amount of cases and types of cases that they're starting to see. Um, so again, it's important that having a policy is one thing, but ensuring that you're practicing the policies that you have in place, that you are conducting reviews or audits of your procedures, and documenting that also helps to mitigate risk to your organization. For example, looking at um, your hiring process, uh, having a checklist or having an outside individual come in and such as, you know, Ray, we, all, we also talk through and work through HR compliance audits with our clients. Of here's what you should have on your application. Here's what you should do when you're posting jobs. Here's what you should do from an EEOC perspective. Um, really ensuring that you are doing the best to be sure your organization is compliant. And there's a lot to know, and we don't expect you to know everything, and that's where the resources come into play. But, you know, we do expect to see additional um, support and some training coming out in reference to anti-discrimination policies in the workplace as well. Next slide. Um, actually, let's back up one more. Um, I do want to talk a little bit further about um, what are we hearing from 2021, new administration coming in uh, with President Biden here in January, and what are some things to keep on your radar as an employer as it relates to HR and compliance? Um, some of those include, you know, looking at the, there could be potential to update the federal minimum wage there could be updates to the Department of Labor and the um, the type of overtime calculation and how um, the classifications of, of individuals, that's very important. Also looking at there could be some changes in the recruitment process and a lot of companies uh, might utilize non-compete agreements or uh, different types of things such as that. Um, we're hearing there could be some changes with that as well. So there are a lot of upcoming regulatory changes too. And, you know, we again will share resources with you and be sure that as organizations, we are sharing the most up-to-date um, information as we go forward. Um, next slide. So we want to talk through right now um, the resource pages that we have here specifically for you. And as we mentioned, the RAID Associates, this is our HR and our, and our firm's um, COVID Resource Center that we have broken out. There are a lot of different sections and subject matter experts that you can access information on this site. So please be sure you check that out. The EEOC will actually be the resource for you for employment questions and resources as well as it relates to Title VII. We've also shared here the Ohio Department of Health, and this is specific, very helpful for uh, coronavirus questions, and there's a free 1-800 hotline number as well. Um, we've talked with them numerous times, and they also will refer you back to your local health department as well, but there are a lot of free PDF resources and posters and different things on this site, in addition to the CDC site that we have listed below, and a lot of um, ever-changing information. So these are also, uh, these links are also on our COVID-19 resource page as well. Um, SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management, is also a link there that um, is, a, is a good resource as well. OSHA, again, we've talked about that, and there's even some templates there for um, potential checklist for audits that you could utilize. Uh, the unemployment is the next one, and this one has, again, all the different types of the call center numbers, all the different um, levels of the types of unemployment insurance. There's an employer page, for you as an employer, you can go into your unemployment account and look and see 
what actually has been charged or what employees are falling under your unemployment claims. Again, that's a great resource for you as the employer to be sure that you don't have any fraudulent claims that are on there. Also, there's chat lines there as well and resources. We are hearing that the average wait time for calls relating to unemployment questions are like a half hour now where um, back in March and April, they were days. So um, again, there are resources there to help navigate as we move through. And also the Department of Labor is another resource for you that will talk through um, overtime requirements, posters, and a lot of different resources for you. We expect that there are a lot of questions, so we wanted to save a, a, a good bit of time to kind of talk through some of those. Um, again, this is a lot of information. Um, we expect that we'll continue to share updates as we move forward, but we'd like to see if there's any questions we can answer specifically now. Okay, thanks Renee. Um, the first question that we have here is, does the FFCRA reset as of January 1st, 2021? In other words, are employees who claim wages through this program in 2020 eligible again in 2021? That's a great question. Um, thank you. And no, it does not reset. So an individual is eligible for up to a maximum of 80 hours, as it shows on that spreadsheet, for those specific criteria listed at the top. Um, so it's not a start, stop, or... Um, so once it's done, it's done. Great, the next question we have here is, should a business choose to not have an official announcement slash policy to extend FFCRA leave on the books? Are we able to elect to provide it to individuals when and if someone may need it? That's a great question. And um, from a compliance perspective, it is recommended that Consistency in your administration of the policy, even if you don't have anything in writing, needs to be consistent. Doing it on a case-by-case -case basis would really open your organization up for risk. So this is a two-part question. So the second part, part is, is, do we have to have a formal process slash policy or it can only be offered when somebody needs it? And you kind of answer that part, but do they need a formal process slash policy? Um, yeah, there, there is. And there are templates available, um, and we're happy to, to talk through and share those with you. Um, so, yes, there are policies that are out there that, you know, are specifically say, here's the requirements of the FFCRA. And there's also posters that are available, too. Whatever organizations might have had in place in reference to FFCRA prior to December 31st and it changing to voluntary can still be utilized. The, the law itself and the benefit has not changed. It's just the voluntary basis of employers offering it is the biggest change. So the next question we have here is for FFCRA pay, how do we calculate the rate of pay for employees who make tipped minimum wage and their tips slash hour vary every week? So far, I just pay them the non-tipped minimum wage, 880 an hour in Ohio for their FFCRA leave hours. Is this okay? Um, that's a great question, and if I could circle back around and talk to that individual, um, you know, via email, we can follow up on that. Um, you know, yes, there's there's a way to ensure that you're looking at that average wage, um, and I'm happy to talk about that further. Sounds great. I will send you that information after. The next question we have here is: Is there a charge to the employee to get the vaccine? And that would be so, depending on an organization and your health benefit plan, um, there should be no cost. But again, it depends on what your plan is and, and how that rolls out. Most of the insurance plans are, are predicted to cover that as uh, wellness or so it's important to reach out to your insurance broker on that. Uh, the next question we have here is, Someone told me an additional 10 days were granted to employees after December 31st, 2020. Is this true? Only employees who did not use all 10 days yet can use it before March 31st, 2021. I'm not sure on the question if they're saying 10 days. Um, it's the 80 hours 
then there's a separate okay. emergency leave. So um, again, we can circle back around on, on that. I think it's that's probably related to the earlier question of does it carry over? So um, yes, I'll definitely send you that okay. question after. Sounds like they're asking if their hours carry over. Um, yeah. So the next question we have here is if an employer learns that an employee was directly exposed to a known positive case of COVID-19 and are aware that this person has been in the workplace and interacted um, an interaction was in close, I believe they're saying it was in close contact with other employees between the known exposure date and the current date. Do we have any legal risk of not requiring that exposed employee to get tested, even if not symptomatic? That's a great question. And, you know, as an employer, it's it's best to, you know, yes, I mean, you if you know that there's an exposure potential, um, you know, reaching out to that individual and requesting that they that they take a test and, and provide it can be an option. But um, I, again, I would talk with your legal resource on that, too, because there's a couple of varying uh, scenarios as well. So the next question we have here is if you decide to extend the FSCRA for your employees, do you have to offer both paid sick leave and paid family leave? Or can you provide only the paid sick leave section? If, if I could repeat that question. So my understanding is we're talking about the FFCRA leave as it relates to the top section of the criteria one through six and then the supplemental for the for taking care of the children for school care, Correct. et cetera. So Correct. no, you you as the employer, if should you decide to continue to offer the FFCRA leave, you would need to offer both. It is not one or the other, it's it's inclusive. So the next thing here, um, it says, I've received many unemployment claims for people that have never worked at my company. Do you mm -hmm. think this is just a clerical error or a possible fraud? I don't know if you know the answer to that one. <laughs> that, that's a great question, and it's a very common question. And, you know, I myself can't say it, what is, it, it could be either one of those. Um, definitely as a resource, we would say, as we, as we mentioned earlier, reach out. Um, to the unemployment office via the site that we have here listed. And, you know, there's a representative you can talk to um, that can also kind of shed some light and look and see specifically, you know, what has been charged. And again, we're seeing a lot of that could be clerical error, could be, um, you know, an issue of, of fraud as well. And, you know, specifically, you know, as, as an individual, I know for myself, if I if there's if I'm an employee and and one of my unemployment claims came through to my employer and they know that and I know that I didn't file it, I would want to know that personally just from a protection standpoint from my social security and was there you know some fraud there. So it, it's 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 an important thing to follow up on. Okay. So the next question we have here is what do you see as some best practices in keeping employees up to date? Some are working from home and some are on the factory floor. And they said, Renee is the best. <laughs> Thank you. Um, great question. And, you know, so you can never communicate too much. And, I, and you know, it's important. There's different ways for your remote individuals. Um, is there a weekly, you know, just quick email you can send out to everyone, you know, of here's some updates and here's our current safety protocols um, for your workforce that's on the floor that's you know on the production floor is there you know information you can again a lot of these resources are free from from the CDC that you can print and hang them at the time clock um, you can put things in you know, if people actually have paychecks you can you know put them in paycheck stuffers you can send them out via email the, one of the best practices that we also wanted to talk about was sharing and continuing to share the importance of best practices with social distancing, wearing your mask, keeping that still in the forefront of workplaces is very important. Um, I've talked to a couple companies that, you know, when they have their um, their monthly safety meeting that, that they talk about. Here's a topic that we want to talk about from a safety perspective as it relates to COVID and also as it relates to another topic. Um, same thing if you have a remote workforce and you're having your Skype meetings. Um, 
again, pick a topic that, you know, anytime you have your workers together for any type of function or any type of meeting, it's great to just say five minutes here. Here's a rundown of where we are and here's some upcoming things. Great. So the next question we have here is we have employees that use that use FFCRA hours as they need, as we do not as we have not had any need to take off because of COVID. Do I need to have a form filled out for this? Okay, so um, that would be something I would need to talk with that individual about further. Um, because if they if they qualify for the FFCRA leave then they should be receiving their pay for that. So I guess it's, I'm, I'm unsure as to the, the question. Okay, yeah, I'll send it to you Yeah, afterwards. I'll circle back around. Sure. Um, the next question we have here is, is there a separate emergency leave that covers an employee who may have a need after the 80 hours of FFCRA leave are used and the mm -hmm. new leave is not child care related? So, and that's a good question. Um, again, that goes back to your organization and, you know, the, the leave as it stands right now, um, say the leave is exhausted for what's allotted through the FFCRA, that would then tie in conjunction to your family medical leave uh, within your organization if that, if, if your organization needs to be compliant, if you have that number of employees. Whatever existing leave policies you have in place prior to using any of the FFCRA leave is still in play, but you would need to talk about that, what that correlation looks like between the two. Cool. Um, and then we have one question, one last question here, and then of course those other questions we will circle back on um, one on one, and then I'll give you some time to kind of um, give your final thoughts, Renee. But it says, if an employer chooses to continue FFCRA, does an employee's unused time out of the 80 hours extend into 2021? I believe that's very similar to the earlier question of, mm -hmm. yes, if they have not used it at this point, um, you know, the 80 hours are still going to be in effect through 2021. Now we know that as of March 31st this year, currently as it stands, that's when the regulation could change. Um, but right now, that's that's where it stands. Awesome, and that was the last we have here. Um, and I'll give you some time to kind of give your final thoughts. Sure, thank you, Imani, and thank you everyone for your questions. Um, I know that this is a lot of information. There's a lot of different scenarios. You know, our goal with our discussion today is try to, you know, touch base on those key items for 2021, resources for you and your employees, and best practices to help mitigate risk for your organizations. And as we move forward, we expect continued changes and we'll definitely share those with you. And, you know, the biggest, best advice, you know, I can give to employers now is, we understand everyone is, you know, moving through a lot and your employees and yourself are dealing with a lot of, of different things, you know, through this time. So it's important to keep a pulse on your on your organization and your employees, too. And, you know, if there's the need for, you know, mental health services, um, being a resource and sharing resources with them at that time and continuing to is, is very important. Everyone's focused on taking care of themselves and their families, um, and we, we want to ensure that we help support them. So anything you can do to help would be appreciated, and we appreciate you taking time to uh, attend our webinar. And if you do have any other questions, you have my contact information, and please visit our firm's website as well. Thanks, Renee, and thank you guys for joining us for today's webinar on New Year, New HR Compliance Considerations. We hope that Renee was able to provide you with some valuable insight. If you sign off today and realize that you have additional questions, you're always welcome to reach out to Renee directly. You can also contact any of our RAID team members by clicking the People section on the firm's website at www.raidcpa.com. Don't forget to watch your inbox for an evaluation survey, access to the recording of today's webinar, and more. Thank you, and we hope you have a great day.